Well, good afternoon uh, to the afternoon session. Um, and we would just like to welcome, we've got uh, three people joining us uh, in person for the afternoon session. We weren't here in the morning session. So uh, welcome Alan, who is a uh, school librarian um, for the school's library service at the Gilorle Public Library in town. Uh, we have Lucy joining us who uh, left school last year uh, and is desperately keen to become a school librarian and has very kindly volunteered her help. Uh, so Lucy has been enormously helpful to me over the last good couple of months. Uh, so much of what you see around you today is thanks to Lucy's hard work. So welcome, Lucy. And then uh, welcome to Vicky, who is new to Ladies College, uh, yeah, which is an, in is an independent um, girls' school. And if you'll forgive me, what age range? So preschool all the way through to year 13. So that's the same as uh, same as Blanche, Blanche, Blanche and College. Um, I know that there is at least, well, there are at least two people online, one of whom is Barbara, who is presenting this afternoon. So that is good. And we have ironed out the technical difficulties. Um, and there is at least one other person who has joined us online. Um, so welcome to those who have joined us online, as well as those who will um, be joining us at a later point uh, through the recordings. So it's a great pleasure to be able to share about the uh, implementation of the IFLA School Library Guidelines at Blancheland College. And you will notice that I haven't said um, the implementation of FOSSIL um, at Blancheland College. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And um, there's also a sense in which my talk is only a snapshot or a small part of the broader um, implementation of everything that the uh, IFLA School Library Manifesto and the School Library Guidelines represent. So everything that you have already heard and everything that you will hear over the course of today and tomorrow uh, is all an elaboration on this idea of implementing the um, IFLA School Library Guidelines. And as I said before, not just at Blancheland, but the implementation of the guidelines in any setting where people have been inspired by the guidelines and aspire to implement them. Um, so this is just sharing something about our journey uh, in the hope that uh, you may take something useful away uh, with you. So I did mention this uh, in, in, in the morning session, but uh, two, two things that really have guided my journey as a school librarian from stumbling into school librarianship by mistake and discover by chance um, or by design and discovering a calling in the library um, is this idea of not despising the day of small beginnings. Um, and that in this passage from Zechariah, um, that God uh, rejoices to see the plumb line. Um, so a plumb line is a weighted device uh, that you use to ensure that the thing that you are building is straight. And because it's straight, it, you can build tall and strong. Um, so the two things really to take away from that are um, we don't know what will come of the work that we do, even if it appears very modest um, and insubstantial or insignificant. Um, but it's also important that we build well, that we start well. So uh, we will come to this idea of, of what our plumb line is. Um, and then uh, maybe an interesting contrast between uh, Zechariah and Nietzsche, uh, who maybe is more infamous remembered for announcing the death of God. Um, but there's an interesting story there. Um, but this idea of um, a, a certain value that attaches to something 
um, which is only the consequence of a long obedience in the same direction. So the question then is how do we sustain a long obedience in the same direction? And uh, this is an absolutely extraordinary um, little piece from Octavia Butler's um, book, The Parable of the Talents. Uh, when vision fails, direction is lost. When direction is lost, purpose may be forgotten. When purpose is forgotten, emotion rules alone. When emotion rules alone, destruction, destruction. And there is so much destruction around us. Uh, and I think also, interestingly, there is a struggle within school librarianship. Um, and emotions can run high. And really what the challenge to us is, uh, is to discover that plumb line that will allow us to build well. Um, and that purpose which will sustain this long obedience in the same direction. So for us, the plumb line is the IFLA School Library Guidelines. And I think the thing that has really come home to me uh, in the relatively short time that I have been involved with IFLA on the Standing Committee for School Libraries is that the IFLA School Library Guidelines are an international consensus that draw together over 60 years worth of international research into what makes for an effective school library and effective school library program. Um, so for us, the plumb line is the IFLA school library guidelines. Uh, and then just following the logic of Octavia Butler's a uh, little poem. Um, so a vision for a school library that is integral to the educational pro um, process. Um, now, one of the things that I'm just going to touch on is what I'm beginning to realize on my journey. Um, now, some of you may already have realized this, and for some of you, that realization may still come and it may never come, depending on your context. But um, what what I have begun to realize is that the school library is integral to an educational process, but unfortunately it's not integral to the educational process that tends to be dominant in most schools and in most countries. Um, and that didn't really make sense to me until I began to compare um, the evolution of the IFLA school library guidelines with the um, evolution of the SILIP um, school libraries group guidelines for secondary school libraries. And there is a passage uh, in the 2002 edition of the IFLA school library guidelines, the first edition, um, that says teachers educational philosophy constitutes the ideological basis for their choice of teaching methods. So teachers believe um certain things about how children learn and as a consequence of that they teach in a certain way um and the the guidelines contrast on the one hand a more traditional view of the centrality of the role of the teacher the textbook and the classroom in the educational process so there is an emphasis on the teacher and what the teacher needs to do in order for the student to learn and on the other hand, um, so a different approach, a different educational process is an educational process that centers education on the learning process rather than the teaching process, encourages initiative and independence on the part of the student and brings the student to grips with original thought as expressed in books and other media. So those are two different approaches to teaching and learning and they lead in very different directions. Now, we, we recognize that there must be a balance between the two. So there must be instruction, but that instruction from our perspective must serve the purpose of greater independence um, for students in their learning. Now, um, that is why on this slide, I crossed out the, and I put an, 
um, because I wish that that insight so that this this is, is is just mentioned in the 2002 guidelines. It isn't very well developed. And then um, I think our colleagues around the world have worked through stuff. Um, and this isn't really present in the second edition of the guidelines. Um, but what I'm beginning to appreciate more and more is that this is the key, I think, to our success. Is that we need to be concerned with an educational process that the library is integral to, and that is the basis of our interaction with our colleagues. Because I, I, I see so many colleagues who are struggling to fit the library and what the library does into um, an educational process that doesn't need the library um, and doesn't necessarily even welcome the library. So um, I think the key insight for us is that we ought to be concerned first and foremost with education and the educational process and then with the role of the library in that educational process. Um, so a vision um, that gives rise to a purpose and the, um, the second edition of the, the school library guidelines um, add a moral purpose to the educational purpose. So the school library serves this complex purpose, an educational purpose and a moral purpose. And from the definition, the, the IFLA definition of a school library, um, I think the educational purpose may be understood in terms of the information to knowledge journey. So learning from information and the moral purpose may be broadly understood in terms of the students' personal, social and cultural growth. Um, So then the guidelines are clear that without a pedagogical program, which is a planned comprehensive offering of teaching and learning activities, a school library will not accomplish its educational purpose and therefore its moral purpose. Now, in terms of my evolving understanding of inquiry, um, and Barbara will pick up on this uh, when she speaks in a short while, um, what I had initially understood is that because the school's business is first and foremost education in an academic sense, that includes the whole child, um, that unless we succeed at in our educational purpose, we will never get round to the moral purpose. So unless we are able to convince the school or the educational authorities that we can make a difference to the educational purpose, um, we cannot justify our existence. Therefore, we will never have an opportunity for, to fulfill our moral purpose. But actually what I'm beginning to understand more and more is that inquiry, and we'll come back to the centrality of inquiry in the library's pedagogical program, um, that inquiry in a certain sense integrates the educational and the moral purpose. So because inquiry is concerned with the inquirer, the student as inquirer, and developing the student as an inquirer, um, inquiry brings the educational and the, the, the moral purpose together and allows us to uh, achieve both. So the, the, the guidelines um, identify five um, core instructional activities for the school librarian, um, literacy and reading promotion, uh, media and information literacy, um, and I think interestingly, which can be included in inquiry-based learning. Uh, and I think that is quite important because it is possible to engage in media and information literacy without actually um, engaging with inquiry. However, um, inquiry-based learning, which is a core instructional activity, includes media and information literacy instruction. So it is impossible to engage inquiry in inquiry properly without developing media and information literacy skills, um, technology integration and professional development for teachers. So again, here, one of the insights um, 
that is becoming clearer and clearer to me is that um, inquiry is central to the instructional activity of the school librarian and the school library. It's, it, it, it's um, central to the library's pedagogical program, um, but understood properly, uh, inquiry actually en e enables us to carry out all five instructional activities. So all five instructional activities can be addressed through inquiry understood properly. Um, and then this is something also that um, I've been puzzling uh, about for a while um, because for many colleagues, um, and maybe this is different, um, I'm not, not, not so much the case in other countries, but, but certainly um, for many colleagues in, uh, in the UK, uh, inquiry seems to be a very alien or foreign concept. Um, but I recently managed to track down um, libraries in secondary schools, which was published by the UK School Library Association in 1972. And um, that document was the first publication um, by the School Library Association addressing secondary school libraries. And that doc document uh, identifies three main purposes for the school library. Um, the first one being reference and inquiry, study, background and recreational reading. And the thing that struck me is the similarity between that in 1972 and the core instructional activities of the school librarian in the 2015 edition of the IFLA School Library Guidelines. And what is even more interesting is that um, the School Library Association is, is celebrating 85 years this year. Uh, so I've been looking back over that history. So the School Library Association was um, founded in 1937. And it's very clear from looking at the early history of the School Library Association that that concern that is expressed in this document from 1972, that that concern is shared from the outset of the formation of the School Library Association. So there are some questions to ask, some probing questions to ask, I think, about what and why at a certain point um, our understanding of what a school library is and does changed. And maybe what we need to do to recover that. Um, because this document also makes it clear that a school library has to be judged um, by the use, by its use, against these three purposes. So this is a very interesting slide um, because the school library guidelines drawing on 60 years of international research identify um, three key success criteria. Um, which I think for school librarians all around the world are also obstacles. Um, so the first one is staffing, and that is both professional and paraprofessional. So a qualified, a professionally qualified librarian who in some sense is also a teacher who is supported by paraprofessionals and that that staffing needs to be in sufficient numbers according to the size of the school and its unique needs. Um, I would just mention here that uh, the Australian School Library Association has a very, very useful document um, about appropriate levels of staffing for schools of different sizes at both secondary and primary, and that includes professional and paraprofessional. It's the most detailed description of school staffing that I have found. Um, and that becomes part of the plumb line. Um, but you can only justify that level of staffing um, if you have a clear vision and a clear purpose, um, and that you have a plumb line and you are building well according to that plumb line. So the second thing then is the uh, targeted high quality diverse collection. 
that supports the formal and informal curriculum. Um, so again, it is necessary to look to professional guidelines um, for guidelines on the size of the print and online collection, as well as the composition. Um, so this library is new. Uh, we are still in the process of developing the collection. Um, the collection as it stands for secondary school, this is the senior library, so um, children from years 11 through to uh, 18. Um, we may be just, 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 just creep into the minimum recommended number of books per student. Um, but that is not sufficient uh, to support inquiry and also recreational reading um, for secondary school. So there is work, creative work that needs to be done on developing the collection. And uh, also very interestingly, um, maybe we disagree slightly with the SLA guidelines because they recommend for secondary schools a 50-50% split between fiction and non-fiction. But I think approaching that from the perspective of inquiry, um, so this formal and informal curriculum, um, we're probably looking more, I think, at two-thirds fiction to one-third, I mean, two-thirds non-fiction to one-third fiction. Um, and at the moment, we're looking at about 50-50. So we would need to increase that, which is largely the non-fiction, uh, without necessarily losing this. Um, so work to be done on staffing at, at, at Blancheland. We are, we, are, we are working towards a plumb line. Um, there is work to be done on developing the, the, the collection, although we have begun well. Um, but I think we are doing very, very well for an explicit policy and plan for ongoing growth and development. Um, and that is because of the plumb line. So the plumb line enables us to be very clear about what it is that we need to do and ideas about how to go about doing that. So what is very interesting is that um, an American colleague, Daniel Callison, um, so he, 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 he speaks about um, two different things in relation to inquiry. The first one that um, the first one is that uh, um, an evolution towards inquiry in and through the library was well underway, certainly in America since the 1960s. Um, but as we've seen from the uh, the SLA document, um, certainly for, for for the UK in 1972, there was a a concern with inquiry that we can argue stretches back to 1937. Um, and in fact, I think a case could be made for um, the library being born of inquiry. Uh, so as long as school libraries have existed, uh, a place in which to be filled with wonder and awe and finding out for yourself. Um, so that book, this book, um, I think reaffirms the centra centrality of inquiry. And I think it is an encouragement um, that there is this long obedience in the same direction. It's a certain view of what education is and what it means for a child to be educated and the role of the school library and librarian in that education. Um, so there are four, five models of inquiry included in that. Um, I was hoping to get the table of contents, which is not available yet. But I think there are colleagues from at least six different countries who have contributed to this book. So there are five different models of the inquiry process, but there are colleagues, I think there's something like 30 colleagues from six different countries who have contributed to this book. Um, and that includes the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum, which um, Barbara is responsible for and will touch on in her talk, um, and Fossil, which um, I adapted from Barbara's work. Um, and it's just important to mention that, uh, so in the context of the um, sessions here, um, Fossil and the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum is our perspective, but um, we are talking about inquiry more broadly. Um, so anything that we say about fossil can be applied more broadly. And in fact, many of the insights um, in that, that are shaping the ongoing development of the information fluency continuum and fossil um, come from outside. So just very quickly um, before I, I, I 
pass over to Barbara. Uh, because we seem to, or because many colleagues seem to have um, I think lost sight of the importance of inquiry to what it is that we do um, is just a, 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 a reminder that in its broadest sense, inquiry is a stance. It's an attitude of wonder and puzzlement. It gives rise to a dynamic process of coming to know and understand the world and ourselves in it. And I think absolutely crucially um, that that is the basis for responsible participation in community. So you would like to think that as children are filled with awe and wonder, come to a true understanding of themselves and themselves in relation to other people, um, that may be this destruction, destruction that is the consequence of uh, emotion ruling unchecked. Yeah, maybe we can change that. So um, there are a number of things that I have learned from um, Barbara's work, but 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 recently uh, in collaboration, active collaboration with her. Um, so so I think the first thing is is a, a real sense of the librarian is a teacher, and the subject, the librarian's subject, is learning. It's the learning process, and that that really ought to be the focus of our um, collaboration with our classroom colleagues. So teachers who are based in the classroom rather than teachers who are based in the library. Um, and she is very, very clear that a model of the inquiry process is only the first step in empowering students to pursue inquiry on their own. So empowering students as inquirers. The next step is to structure teaching. So library-based library teachers and classroom-based teachers working together to structure teaching around a framework of skills. So we have a model um, and then we have skills that enable that model. Um, and those skills need to be developed progressively and systematically. Um, so one of the things that will be very interesting tomorrow um, when Jenny talks about um, extracurricular inquiry, she will be focusing on inquiry in the last two years of school. And uh, I don't think she'll mind if I um, share uh, her conclusion today. Uh, but the conclusion is you don't want to start here. You don't want to start at the end. We want to start at the beginning and we want to build well to empower students to. Um, and that this development of these inquiry skills systematically and progressively must happen in the context of subject area teaching. So it's not just something that happens in the library outside of the classroom. We are collaborating with colleagues in the classroom um, to develop these essential and independent learning skills um, using the material in the subjects that they are studying. So that is the challenge and um, that will um, be addressed by Jenny and our colleague Joe from our previous school um, when they talk about their collaboration in A-level politics, so um, politics in year uh, the last two years of school, so um, inquiry in the classroom. So just um, very quickly, these these are links in the slide, so it will be possible to, um, to check, but um, those six stages of the inquiry process are the same as the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum. Um, so connect is the sense of awe and wonder that sets the process of inquiry, this process of coming to know and finding out uh, sets that process in motion. Um, and all, all inquiry models on some level share the same essential stages. Um, so that process of coming to know and finding out. Um, so what we've what we've tried to do for each of those stages as we've gone along um, is just to share as much as we can about what we are understanding is happening in each of those stages. So to be able to describe um, broadly what kind of activity is happening in that stage. Um, and then uh, I think what has become very interesting is that in um, um, Barbara led the reimagining of the 2009 information fluency continuum in 2019. Um, and one of the, the, the 
um, key developments um, was the addition of skill sets within each stage. So we know more or less what we're trying to do in Connect. We're trying to engage students as inquirers. We're trying to help them to activate background knowledge, um, to link what they are trying to find out with what they already know, um, which then opens up into wonder, opens up into questions. But um, this addition of the, the, sub, um, the skill sets within each stage is enormously helpful. because it makes the learning process more explicit and it makes the skills that we are needing to equip students with and then develop within students more explicit in each stage. And some of those stages I think are more comfortable for librarians than others. Um, and I think the challenge for us is to be interested in and concerned about the whole process and the role of the, the library and the librarian in each stage of the process. Because interestingly, that is actually what our classroom based colleagues need help with the most. Um, I think we tend to think very quickly they need information and they need to be taught how to cite and reference the information. But actually, you'll see from the talk with um, between Joe and Jenny, uh, that it's the process and the learning process uh, where, we, where we can make the most dramatic impact. Um, and then of course, I think from my perspective, one of the things that really does set the information fluency continuum and then by extension um, um, fossil apart, I think is the, the level of detail in describing the skills that make up each skill set. So the individual skills from, um, so, so in, 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 in American terminology, PK uh, through to grade 12. So from the entry point to school to the exit point of school, um, there is a detailed description of the skills as well as the development of those skills from year to year to year for each of the skill sets. Um, so that spreadsheet um, that, uh, we developed there uh, is based on the skills that Barbara developed for the information fluency continuum, but they are available in a spreadsheet um, in the, the colors that we assigned to Fossil. Uh, and it is possible then to search um, for individual skills and then to track the development of that skill in the spreadsheet um, all the way through from pre-kindergarten through to, to grade 12. Uh, and then also what we've tried to do is just because we've made many, many mistakes as we've been finding our way and we are, are trying to share what we are finding out along the way in the Fossil Group Forum. Um, and really what we're trying to do is to develop our understanding and our expertise in supporting inquiry in the classroom. And there are some good examples uh, of collaborating with teaching colleagues on inquiry in content area learning, so subject learning, um, but also uh, both of which we'll address tomorrow, uh, extracurricular inquiry. So opportunities to do extended projects independently of what is happening um, in normal subject teaching. Um, and then also uh, both in the information fluency continuum, but also on the fossil group websites, all very well, um, to know what skills you're trying to develop, but then actually being able to teach those skills and to develop those skills and to assess those skills requires resources. Um, so there are a growing number of resources um, to support the, de the acquisition and the development of these inquiry skills systematically and progressively over time. So um, this is an appropriate point for me to attempt to hand over to Barbara.